Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul and my all. What beautiful lyrics. Welcome this morning. Wow. Is this real? Is spring real? I mean, the forever pessimist Alex Barankovich, when I said this, he said to me yesterday, oh, don't get fooled, Tony. Don't get too excited. Let's hope he's dead wrong. Alex, are you open to being wrong? No, all right. <laughs> Just figured I'd ask. Um, so we're going to be continuing our, our uh, series on Jesus' invitation to come follow him. All right? But before we do that, I've got a couple of announcements that I'd like to uh, uh, let you be aware of. Uh, the Ottawa Church will be combining with the Montreal Church to have a men's retreat uh, uh, in June. And June 7th weekend, so... Um, Brothers, I will send you the information in the newsletter, so don't be aware. Just want to let you mark the date there uh, uh, for us to register. And the women also are going to be having one in the fall. And so uh, more uh, details on that to come a little later. Come follow me. This invitation last week was merely that. This invitation to come follow Jesus irrespective of where you were on your spiritual journey. As a matter of fact, as we saw, no experience necessary. As a matter of fact, some of the qualifications in the, to receive this invitation is that some of you didn't even need to believe. Being even a sinner and a tax collector. And we talked about last week that the tax collectors were in a place by themselves, that they were separate. The sinner says, don't include us with them. <laughs> And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about that and, and really delve into the scriptures a little bit more to illuminate that call, all right? And, and we'll realize that the Bible makes a lot of sense even sometimes when apparently at first it really rocks our world, okay? And sometimes for, for effect, we can read the scriptures and honestly not be as diligent as we need to be in order to fully comprehend what Jesus was calling us when he issued that invitation. And the idea was that Jesus was going to issue this invitation to everyone. That call, however, was not about pedagogy, right? It's not about simply studying the teachings of Christ, coming into a classroom and understanding what the teachings was, and, but the idea was call to a relationship. This call to follow me was for a relationship. And so, to get us to understand this even a little bit more, what we're going to do this morning, we're going to examine the calling of what we call the first disciples. You would realize that in the scriptures, as we understand it now, there are a number of people that followed Christ. There were large crowds who were following Christ because he was a freak show. He was, he was healing people. He was feeding people all over the place. Somebody who feeds you, you're going to go. For some, like some of the women that followed Christ and Lazarus and Martha and Mary, this call actually were people who were helping him with this ministry. There was a, that, that was... Another level, if you would, of followership. And then he issued the call to the 12 disciples. And we'll understand that a little bit more as we finish this series. What this call to these 12 guys and ultimately what it led to. But let's go ahead and look. And I think to illuminate this idea of who this Christ indeed was. As a matter of fact, in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 1, in Mark chapter 1, we are going to start there, and we're going to look when the first disciples were called. Now, context, of course, as we've talked about here, is everything. 
Because we can, if we don't understand things in context, we can get abused by the scriptures, by people who has an apparent knowledge of it. And so the idea, the four gospels, which is what records the life of Christ, we realize that Matthew and John were two eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus. They actually walked with Christ and they then shared about their experience with Jesus. We read Mark. Mark was a guy who spent a lot of time with Peter and Peter recounted with him his walk with Christ and so he, go, he went ahead and he recorded basically Peter's disposition and his followership and his eyewitness account, if you would. Mark was not an eyewitness account. And then we have Luke. Luke certainly was not an eyewitness. What Luke was, he was an investigator. And what Luke did, Luke says, okay, I want to find out about this Christ. And so what he did, he went and investigated. He did interviews. He, he uh, figured out other things that were going around then, uh, articles, if you would, where people are talking about this, the marketplace, eyewitnesses. And so he went and did an investigation, and then he wrote down what that was all about. Matthew was primarily written to Jews so that they could understand, I'll do this another time, but Matthew, it, it, it's fully remarkable how he focuses on David, who was, of course, Israel's greatest king. He focused on how it was from the lineage of Abraham, and of course, Abraham is very, very integral to the, uh, to the Jewish traditions. And then what he did remarkably is how he uh, walked through uh, when Jesus was in the Jordan River, when he went into the wilderness, and then when, um, and how that was very much what the old Israelites did when they were by the Jordan River and they went into the wilderness. And there was a very big parallel that Jesus used for the book of Ma uh, that Matthew used to help the Jews to understand who the Christ was. He didn't focus on some aspects of it. What he did, rather, he just wrote some things down and he said, okay, that's what it is. Sometimes we read that and we think that's exactly how it all happened, whereas he was just writing the gist of what was there. And so this brings us to the calling of the first disciples. And so we read in, the, in Mark's account, Peter is talking to Mark, and this is what Peter, this is what Mark says in verse 16 to 20. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. What? Is that what happened? It doesn't seem to be faithful to me. It seems to be irresponsible. This is their guy's job, and they had a family. We'll see that in a second. I mean, is, is that actually what happened? Let's continue. It gets worse. Worse? Yes. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother in a boat, preparing their nets. They live their lives like this, and they seem to have no care about what's going on in the world, and they seem to have no responsibility because people are following these kinds of disciples. Well, you got to understand why Math, uh, Mark was writing this. And so that we got to understand what he's trying to say. It's sort of like when people ask me about something that happened and they ask my wife. Sometimes people ask and they realize, is this the same event? <laughs> my wife would ask me, honey, so how did it go? Oh, we went to a restaurant, we ate, and it was good. That can't be just what happened. There are more things that happened. We went here, we ate this, we thought about that, the weather was like that, and all that kind of stuff. You might think it's two different events, but sometimes that's how we report things. What is the purpose for which you're asking? And so the context on these scriptures is very, very important. These guys were, you will see, are anything but irresponsible. 
in their followership of Christ. And as we talked about last week, there are people in this audience that are different places in their walk with God. Some are coming for the first time. Some have been coming for a while. Some have been here. They're, ter- they're getting blue hair. I mean, it's just all kinds. And some people are losing their hair, like Andrew. I mean, sorry. People, some people are losing their hair just simply coming here. I hate when they say those things and they come out uh, audibly. But it's what I think, but it, what, what comes up. Um, and yet... This call is issued to us all. But I want to go back and investigate and help us to understand even our followership of Christ and when Jesus calls these first disciples. So let's look at another account. John chapter 1. In John chapter 1 now, we look. John certainly did not go about writing this account the same way that Mark did. And you'll see. And even if you read the Gospels, you'll find that some emphasis were different than others. This one here specifically, John was also addressing the Jews, but also from a miraculous vantage point and all the miracles that he performed. As a matter of fact, you'll find that in in the Gospel of John, that, that number seven, which was a very good number, for the Jews, that there were seven times that he addressed Jesus as the I, I, I am. There are seven times that he uh, performed miracles. And so that number, and the way that this book is written, it is so unbelievably phenomenal. When I read the scriptures and I see all these insights, it only impresses me that this is not written by man. That there's one authorship in Christ that actually brings this all of this stuff together. It's so fantastic. Anyways, so let's go back. I don't have to. Well, if you, when you come back, we'll, uh, we'll talk about all that kind of stuff, and you'll realize what we're talking about. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of taste there. And so in John chapter 1 and verse 35, we see a little bit here of the calling of the first disciples. We see a little bit more inside, okay? It says the next day, John, this is John the Baptist, okay? JTB, okay? Uh, this is John the Baptist was there again with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, once again, what is he trying to communicate here? He's not trying to go through a detailed response. He's giving the essence of what is happening. I would imagine it was a little bit more commotion than that, but anyways, that's what he wrote. Figured that's all we needed. When the two disciples heard them, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So, w- what's going on here? So, this guy, and we'll understand, get his name in a second. Okay, this guy was with John the Baptist, because John the Baptist was also a freak show. He went into the wilderness, he was eating locusts and wild honey, and he's got leather belt. I mean, he was just, people were, some of it, it was a freak show. Some of it, He was preaching the word, and people appreciated what he was doing. And so these two guys were followers of John the Baptist. Okay, two of them. And John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God, speaking here of Jesus. One of these guys, we pick it up, it says, so they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. And so Jesus didn't quite issue the, hey, leave everything yet. He says, I know you heard about me, and I know you trust John because you are one of his disciples, and he says, that guy is a cool guy, so to speak. And Jesus says, I know where you're at, and it's okay. Just come and observe. Come and see. Just look at what is going on. Andrew, Simon's brother, was one of the two. Aha! So one of the two guys, his name was Andrew. And he says, who was one of the two, heard what John had said, and who would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And so Andrew... So fired up, so excited, he spent some time, 
And he says, okay, this guy is awesome. I got to go tell my brother about this. That's the first thing he says. After he observed, after he realized, he says, this is worth further investigation. This is worth even telling somebody else about it. Hey, you come check it out. Is it as awesome as I think it is? I don't know. So it's not an Andrew saying, I'm leaving anybody. He says, I want some other people to see what's going on. Is this, is this worth it? Is this cool? And so, the Bible says, Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. So here are these guys. We see Andrew. We see Peter. Then we see Philip. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and said, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the one about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. And Philip Probably heard Jesus. He says, come and see. Ah, oh, we don't know what's going on. Just come. Let's check it out. Let's check it out for ourselves. When, Nathaniel, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel humbly says, how do you know me? <laughs> Jesus said, this guy is so awesome. And Nathaniel says, I'm glad you recognize my awesomeness. How did you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree under, uh, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And so what we see here is that Andrew was called. Peter was called. Philip was called. Nathanael was called. We see how we see this investigation. This like, this is curious enough for me to make sure that I get some other people. This is at least interesting. If these claims are true, this has enormous ramifications. But I'm not just simply going to do something because somebody says something. Now, we might buy a phone because of that. Hey, uh, my experience with my iPhone is awesome, great. All right, what do you think? Great. I've got a, whatever, Honda Civic, awesome, love it. Man, you would enjoy it, great. We don't mind getting people's recommendation. But this idea of following Christ and, and giving our whole lives, because this doesn't come with, a, with a, hey, let's just tr try it out. This is life-altering. And if a phone alters your life, we've got other discussions to talk about. But anyways. But the idea is, this is enormous. And so this Mark's account, they left it. It was a little bit more than that, you see? There's some communication. Let's go check it out. Let's figure it out. Is it what we want? Can I do this? Well, Luke now illuminates and magnifies it even more for us. And so that's where we're parked for the next few minutes, okay? In Luke chapter 5, because he is the guy that's the investigator. And Luke's um, audience was actually people like us in general, meaning the Gentiles, who didn't know much and, and, and didn't have that kind of background. And so he wants to help us to understand a little bit more. Okay, before we turn, did I say the book of Luke? Before we do that, we'll, you can keep your finger here. In Luke chapter 4, the chapter before, by the way, Luke says, I'm going to do an orderly account. Why not exclusively a chronological orderly account? But it's generally so. If you want to know how it all happened and the chronology of it in general, 
read the book of Luke. It gives you a great understanding of how all this stuff, and he goes to the beginning, and he goes through all the baptism and, the, and all that kind of genealogies. It gives you, okay, this is how we got here. In Luke chapter 4, Simon was married. You know that. You guys know that. Peter was married, right? And Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And so she had such a high fever, the Bible says. They have heard about Jesus. They said, Jesus, can you come and help this woman? Simon was there. Simon saw that Jesus perform this miracle. And so this idea that it was just Jesus walked up to the guy and said, hey, you come follow me. They dropped everything and follow him does not reconcile with the totality of the scriptures when you read it. Understand, to whom is this being written? You know, my youngest son is getting married in a couple of weeks. Blows me away. He's getting married in Miami. A God-forsaken, I mean, sorry, uh, in Miami. Um, and so, you know, we're going to talk about his honeymoon, right? And, and, and where he wants to spend it. With me and him, when we're going to talk, okay, bam, bam, bam. When mom's going to talk, there are all these details that goes into it. Totally. If you were to ask, so what happened? Yeah, we booked it. It's all cool. It's in Mexico. Great. Awesome. With Melly, it's going to go with all the details. Is this happening? Is this being covered? What about the, the, you know what I'm talking about, different idea. That's what we got to understand when we understand the call that Christ has issued to all of us. And so we get now, so Simon is not a newbie. He knows, he even knows the power that Jesus has in the miraculous, his ability to miraculously do these things. And so now we pick it up in Luke chapter 5 about when Simon was now called to follow Christ. One day in verse, chapter 5 verse 1, as Jesus was, walk, was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Now, I don't know how many of you uh, understand fishing, but where I grew up, we had like casting a line into the, to, into, the, into the water is not how you fish, right? That's a relatively new phenomenon. But throwing a big net is how people would fish. And that's what was happening. This is a big deal. So these guys had just finished fishing. Washing their nets was a big deal. They're cleaning their nets. They're getting prepared for the next day. This is not just let's rinse it. This is an arduous, significant thing that they were doing. And so they're washing their nets. They're done. Jesus, the freak show, is drawing crowds still because he's doing all these kinds of things. And these two, the people in view here, when Luke is writing, is the calling of the first disciples. And so he's giving this scenario, Jesus is preaching the word, and people are listening to him. And so he went up to two people who were done fishing for the day. They were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Now you've got to understand this. You see there's a relationship here. Jesus didn't just simply go up and walk up to, to Simon and says, let me go into your boat. Remember, he's healed his mother-in-law just a little bit before. There was a dynamic there. There was a relationship there that says, hey, let's, I'm going to, can I use your boat? They got to the point where the, he said, let me step into your boat. Sort of like when you develop a friendship with someone and you, got to the, you get to the point, hey, hey, man, can I borrow your bike or whatever, some, or your lawnmower? You, you get to that point, you know, and then you get more intimate 
with a relationship and it may uh, uh, require you to get something even more than that. But the point remains that this was not a relationship that was formed out of thin air. And this request to follow Christ was not out of thin air. There was a relationship that developed. There was a timing that was there. But Peter was not yet there. And so Jesus says, hey, can I borrow your boat, so to speak? And what happens? Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. This is where the rubber meets the road. So Jesus is teaching. Obviously, the people are fired up about hearing him because at least what he was saying was cool sounding. And then he turns his attention to Peter. And he says, Peter, of course, was called Simon at this point. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. I don't know what the dynamic here was. There was enough of a relationship with Jesus that Peter said, Master, well, you translate that for a little bit. That word actually is a, a, a term of respect. I respect you, Christ. I respect you, Jesus. Actually, you didn't quite know what to make of this Christ thing yet. I respect you, but I'm struggling. I know you healed my mother-in-law who was really sick. And I know we're friends enough that you're borrowing my boat. But dude, you're a carpenter. And I'm a fisherman. And I was fishing all night and haven't caught a thing. And I don't know if you know this, Big J. Daytime fishing in these neck of the woods, not what you do. See, the fish wants to go down to cool water. They don't want to stay up at the top. And I don't want to explain and go into depths about what fishing is all about. Why don't you stay in your lane? But I'm struggling a little bit. We have a friendship, and you're asking me to do something in front of everybody, and I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to show them we're fighting. Ah, this, I'm struggling. I don't want this to be a confrontation. But you're asking me to do something that I have done a thousand times. A thousand times. A thousand times. And I know, if you're anything like me, we hear things from the scriptures and we say, I, I've tried that. I've done and tried this church thing. And let me tell you what my history is. At worst, there are a bunch of fools, and at best, they're good people who are just simply ignorant. And this was an important point. And he says, okay. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, He's not saying so because he is the Lord. No, 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 no. That's not what I get here. I have respect for you. I've seen you gather a crowd, your ability. Simon answered, sorry. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. 
Peter. What just happened here? What just happened here? This carpenter? Just now is teaching me about fishing? <coughs> By the way, read it another time. It's almost the same scenario in the book of John. At the end of, the, at the end of it, Jesus said, hey, put your, put your uh, nets on this side of the boat, and they catch such a large number of, shit, uh, of fish they couldn't bring it in. Anyways, back to this. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Peter, he's in a conundrum. First of all, this carpenter is teaching me to fish, but I'm fired up. We fished all night, haven't caught a thing. Hey, we're going to make some money today. So he called his other buddies. The Bible tells us that they were what? Business partners. When Simon saw this, he fell on Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were James and John, John the sons of Zebedee, Jesus, Simon's partners. And so what happens here was the moment of moments. Peter recognizes not only is this guy a good teacher, not only is this a guy that I need to respect, this is more than this. And his first request was not, let me go into partnership with you. You know how much money we can make? By the way, I don't have time to go into this, but this passage here is often used by prosperity preachers that says, listen, you do think Jesus' way, your business is going to be blessed. A bunch of nonsense. And people who are prey to this kind of nonsense will fall to them. When we don't understand and read the scriptures with what it actually says. Peter didn't say, hey, what? Dude, do you know how long I've been looking for a partner like you? That's not what he said. He falls on his knees and he says, I am so such a sinful, get away from me. I don't deserve to be in your presence. You don't deserve to be in my boat. I mean, meaning that, 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 that this is such an honor. Just, just, it stuns me. And so now we see why. What the story was. He falls and so this was not a one-time confrontation. Jesus was in his ministry. And they understood who he was. And then it says this. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. That's where they left everything to follow him. And you're on a journey. And I'm on a journey. And I don't care if you were baptized or not. Well, I care, you know what I'm saying. Right? <laughs> but this journey that we're on, this call is issued, and we are certain places. And I know for me, in my journey 33 years, when I got baptized, there have been that call that has been issued. And sometimes I did not want. I did not want to sign up for this. Going back into the ministry, that was a big thing that I needed to do. I'd done it for 25 years. 
Now I'm enjoying life in sunny San Antonio. And I'm going to serve the Lord. Oh, yes, no question. That wasn't the debate in my mind. But I don't know where you are in that journey. I don't know if you are still investigating. I don't know where only you do. Some of us play games, if you're anything like me. I saw Ottawa's religion when I was coming to worship this morning. Everybody's out on their bikes. I don't say they need to come here. That's not what I'm talking about. But let's not get fooled. This issue and this invitation to come follow me is issued irrespective of where we are on this spectrum. And it's not about somebody else. It's about following Christ. Right? And if you would permit me some conjecture and some illustration here. Uh, there are people in this audience that are different places. There are some that are the sit and listen. Like when they were saying, hey, curiosity. It's at least interesting. A guy that's speaking looks funny, but it's at least interesting. Some of us are at, hey, we're bold enough to form a relationship like Peter did with, with Jesus. That they actually started exchanging things. Maybe some of us are at a point where, man, I want to investigate this more than just I, I've gone beyond curiosity. I want to ex find out about this more. I'm talking even members of the congregation. I want to investigate this more. And for those of you, there are people who will be willing to sit with you and help you to understand this faith and why we follow the Christ. And, and share what that is all about. Not because we want you to join our church, but because we want you to understand, to, to see this Christ. He's awesome. Some of us, maybe we were, uh, we were being taken to go fishing. And what I mean by that is that something that you had done all your life and somebody saying, try it again for the first time afresh. But I've done this a thousand times. I've gone to so many churches. I've done all this kind of stuff. And Jesus is saying, cast, I know what time of the day it is. I know where it's at. Cast your net. Cast your net. And maybe the last one. It's like Peter, where we surrender. And some of us know maybe it's that time that we surrender our lives to Christ. And we know that there's something in there that we're holding on to. And Peter says, okay, leave that. I'm surrendering to you, Christ. 
Can you imagine? Peter must have been with some renown because he had, he had a business. He has a partnership with other people that right there and then, publicly, after understanding who the Christ was, says, sign me up. Like I said last week, I don't care if it takes you 20 years, we're willing to be with you for 20 years. Get on your journey, whatever, however long it takes. But head towards the next step. I don't have a timetable. We don't have a timetable. Well, how do I know? How do I know? Oh, you'll know. You'll know. My son is 22 years. That's getting married in a little bit. He came to me about two years ago. And he said, Dad, how do I know if I'm ready to get married? What are some things I need to know? I said, you know, I gave some things. And I said, but ultimately, son, you will know. When I got married to this wonderful maiden, no one's going to tell me I was not going to get married to her. <laughs> it was not whether, it's how this thing is going to get done. Because you know. You know in the depths of your heart. Where are you in that journey? Where are you at in that journey? We'll have communion in a couple of minutes. Before we do, we'll have a song at this time. And then we'll go ahead and talk about just for a couple of minutes as we take the communion. So the first thing that we'll do is that we'll sing a song and we'll talk about this idea. And the song is interestingly entitled, Jesus is Lord. Just as Peter said, you now are the Lord of my life, I surrender my life to you. After this, I'll come back up, I'll say a prayer, say a couple of words, um, and then we'll take the communion, and then we'll close our service. So we'll have the brothers come on up, and sisters come on up, and sing Jesus is Lord. I believe that's the song we're singing. Are you going to make me look stupid? Or oh, All right, great, awesome.